Local people, visitors, so forth. Can I ask you to go to the bottom of that white thing? Let's go around and introduce ourselves because uh, we may not know each other's names. So I'm Jim. Sophie. Okay. Deepa. Asuntosh. Benaya. Love you. Okay. You're welcome to everybody. So we finished up 16th chapter. We didn't start 17, did we? No. We finished 16. Uh, we finished 16 chapter last week, so tonight we start the 17th chapter, which is looking at our lives, our behavior, our thought processes through the lens of the three gunas. Guna in Sanskrit has two meanings. They have more than two, but at least two. One, of course, is quality. The other is rope, believe it or not. You think of raju as rope, but guna also means rope. So it's a pun. The great qualities of mind are also ropes that bind us. Ha, ha, ha. That's the pun. So this idea of the gunas is borrowed from Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya philosophy is a much older philosophical system. Sankhya philosophy posits that in the beginning or before there's a beginning, these three cosmic gunas, Rajas, Tamas, and Sattva are in perfect balance. And they move out of balance and creation takes place. One of the things the Sankhya has never actually explained is what made them go out of balance. Of course, nobody's ever been able to explain why did the Big Bang Bang either. So, um, it, it, that's its premise. It also has come to apply microcosmically to the mind states of you and me. So these three gunas are Thomas, Rajas, and Sattva. Thomas is the principle of inactivity. It has qualities of illusion and delusion, of inertia, of lethargy, you may have had periods like this where you feel depressed and you don't want to get out of bed. You don't like your life, so cheap champagne is the solution. That kind of stuff. This is Thomas. Thomas. And there are many cultures that are predominantly Tomasi. More Tomal will do it. Rajas is the principle of activity. Doing, acquiring, achieving. And it's where all of our emotional suffering takes place. Ambition, greed, anger, reaction, jealousy, envy, hurt feelings, all that sort of stuff. All done at the Rajasic mind. The Sattvic mind state is the principle of non-activity. Foolish person sometimes confuses inactivity. Activity. Quality of sattva is your mind is clear. You have sattosha. There's no burning me to acquire, achieve, or accomplish anything. 
and cool sheep. Pure sakwa also is typified by knowledge of myself, and knowledge of what the world is. Now, because our suffering tends to occur in the rajasic mind state, so I'm fundamentally restless, irritable, discontent. What do I do with it? The foolish person tries to fix that feeling. The psychologists call it self soothing. Who's heard that term from your therapist? I eat chocolate at it, drink wine at it. I have sex at it, I gamble, I go on Netflix. I want to fix the feeling, make it go away. I get a fix. The problem with that is at best it's temporary. I eat one piece of chocolate, that's good. What happens if I eat the whole jar? And if we've known anybody who's ever struggled with addiction of any kind, there's the tendencies. You see that it's never permanent. The mind pops back into Rajas. We have the law of diminishing return. When we're dealing with our agitation, I fixing the feelings, pushing the mind into us. The yogi endeavors to move the mind from rajas into sattva. The two basic techniques we have for this are abhyasa, vairagyacha. Practice and Intense renunciation. Let go, let go. So you're driving on the freeway and you have an appointment at a particular time. And because of the damn traffic, you're going to be possibly late. And you hate being late. You know that feeling when you're grabbing the wheel and you're like trying to push the traffic with your heart? Who's ever had that feeling? And a couple things you can do. You can become an aggressive driver and start flipping off the people next to you and bumping their cars and trying to get there. How do you get in trouble? That's fixing the feeling. Or you can let go. Get the word. A whole lot I can do about it. You finally quit gripping the steering wheel and just relax. You don't get there any quicker, but the feeling goes away. It's moving the mind from Rajas. Any questions about these three gunas? Yes, Jimmy. Sorry, I have one question. I'm on Zoom. Um, Who is that? It's Sophie. How are you? I'm good. Sorry, I couldn't come to be uh, in class today face to face, but I'm joining over Zoom for the first time. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have one question regarding uh, what you just said. Because what I've, I've heard about the self-suiting, uh, of course, but I've heard a lot about feeling your feelings. So basically in the example that you gave, what I would do is just get really feel the anger and stay in the anger until it goes away and it does make it go away. But what you're saying is to actually go to another state of mind of acceptance so I'm just well, wondering, yeah. But mm -hmm. self-soothing is different than feeling the anger. Self-soothing is a methodology to get away from the feeling. 
Mm -hmm. If you yeah. feel the anger, and I always say, just don't do something, sit there. What you'll find is that it will dissipate. It will dissipate. You don't have to act on it. You don't have to fix it. So that's actually a technique that moves the mind from Levis into Savo. Oh, I see. Okay, so that is something that will bring you to the acceptance part. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. And the other thought that I had is I didn't understand the difference between inaction and non-action. Inaction is lethargy, indolence, being stuck or depressed. Non-activity is when I'm at peace. And if I'm, it's my duty to act, I can act, but I'm not compelled into action. By I'll be happy when, it'll be better if, more better different, more, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. That's a rajasic kind of action. So when you finally have reached this place where you're not, you, where you, you are content with what you have, you are not trying to, to you know, uh, fix your life by getting more stuff. Can you understand the difference? Yes, and what happens if you actually do need to fix your life? Well, it's an inside job. What do you mean? You will find that if you're unhappy with your life and you change all the external circumstances, there's always the possibility that you'll have the same issues, just the names and faces will change. Oh yeah, of course, but what if what you need to fix is yourself? Exactly. But what is it that we need to fix? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, and by self here, we mean the small self. Okay, yes. but I just wanted to make sure everybody understands these three gunas. And they become a lens through which we look at all sorts of aspects of our lives in this chapter. Thomas, now inactivity, indolence. That's why I'm working. Rajas, activity. Sakwa, non -act. Clarity, stillness. All right, with this in mind, let's start the chapter. Arjuna Vacha Ye Shastra Vidhi Mutsrija Yajante Shraddha Yanvitaha Tesham Nishta Tuka Krishna Arjun said, those who, setting aside the ordinances of the scriptures, perform sacrifice with faith, what is their condition, O Krishna? Is it sattva, rajas, or tamas? So this is a cryptic verse. One can look at it exoterically that it's about ritual, performing sacrifice. But remember back in the fourth and the fifth chapter, when we talked about the yajna, the sacrifice, as a metaphor, such that the mind stands as the sacrificial fire, the senses stand as the priest, the sense objects are the various things we pour into the fire. So we talked about when you perform a deva yajna, your worship of some field of human endeavor. 
So uh, for example, if you're um, a musician, so your deva becomes the music muse. So the ritual you perform is to study and to practice. And if you do that properly, you become a good musician. And it's the same thing in business. It's the same thing in any other field of human endeavor. This is the deeper understanding of sacrifice here. So the person who is acting in the world using this deeper understanding of yajna without understanding the teaching of the scriptures, without shraddha, faith. What happens to them? Now, again, the exoteric meaning is, oh, I get up and I have to do this ritual because this is what we do in our family and I hate doing it, I'd rather be asleep. There's that way of not really having any faith in the scripture. But it has a deeper meaning. It has a deeper meaning. We're going to be dealing with what are the best motives, fiddling motives, and self-destructive motives. So, what happens to people who act in the world? Do this deva yajna. And the deva God comes from the root did to shine. It's a presiding principle over any field of human endeavor, human activity. With that in mind, let's go on. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Triveda Bhavati Shraddha. Dehinam sa swabhavaja Satviki raja si chaiva Tama si cheti tamshranu. The Blessed Lord said, Threefold is the faith of the embodied, which is inherent in their nature the satvik, the rajasik, and the tamasik, uh, which he defines as the pure, the passionate, and the dull or dark. Dost thou hear of it? So, here, Gita is classifying humanity into these three categories. <clears throat> now, this is never for us to hold this up as a test to someone else. Well, there was deep over there, and she Thomas Rajasur said that. Pointless. This is all for our own yoga. Our own self-examination. And we move through these gunas as we move through life. We may start with a very tamasic view of life. And through our practice, we move through rajas into the self. Or at different periods of time. The neat thing about yoga is you can start over in the middle of the day. Does this no good? You cannot have happiness on yesterday's yoga. We do yoga today. You all understand what I mean by yoga. Whatever it is we do that brings us into union with the infinite. Doesn't just mean asana. We're not talking about posture state. So you now you may wake up in a tamasic mood. You have a dream about uh, parents or an old lover, and you're just on the wrong side of the bed to get up. I don't feel like meditating. I don't feel like praying. I'm just going to regret. Then maybe by midday, you go, oh, you know, this isn't been very fruitful. Remember, try some practices. 
see if I can get myself out of that mood. So that's the beauty of yoga. If you can remember the practice anytime. You can't do tomorrow's yoga. Can't do yesterday's yoga. Only doing today's. Any thoughts on this? All right, so he's introducing this lens. Thomas, Rogers, and Sattva. Going on. Sattva Nurupa Sarvasya Shraddha Bhavati Bharata Shraddha Mayoyam Purushoyo Yat Shraddha Yat Shraddha Sa Evasa the faith of each is in accordance with his nature, O Bharata. Man consists of his faith. As a man's faith is, so is he. Yes. As a man thinketh, as a person thinks in his their heart, so are they. Your faith is what you consider a value. Your faith is your God. What I like to do is take the word G-O-D and you just squish it apart a little bit and you put it in another O. G-O-O-D. My good. This is what you worship. Is your good make it more money? Is your good feeling it? Is your good finding a husband or is your good getting the approval of your peers at work? You may think, oh, I believe in God. But if your good is something in the world like that, that's the real God. So we need to examine where our shraddha our thinking is. Oh, well, I believe in God, but I don't know about you. My God's an underachiever. He's not getting me what I want. So I need to get in there and just elbow everybody out of the way so I can get what I want. It's not faith in God. It's faith in your own will. You understand the point. So we want to look at where is our faith? Where is our shraddha? Wonderful word. And whatever we believe in, where our good is, that's our God, and that guides our life. Any thoughts on this? So how much you used to say those people who would come to a camp and they may be Brahmins, but all they're concerned about is money grubbing. They're not interested in the study of scripture. They're not interested in prayer. Meditation. Imagine you're a merchant. All right, next verse. Yajante Satvika Deva Anyakshara Shamsi Raja Saha. The Satvik or pure men worship the gods or devas, the Rajasik or the passionate, the Yakshas and the Rakshasas. 
The other Tamasic people are the dark or dull folk, worship the ghosts, Vedas, and the hosts of Bhutas, or the nature spirits. Yes. So what do we mean by this? The other way to understand this, the Bhutas, is ancestors. So the subtler meaning of this, so the Tama, the uh, um, Sakwit people, they worship these pure principles. First of all, of the infinite, or Ishtadevata, how you choose to approach the divine. Remember, in an earlier chapter, Krishna has said, in whatever way people approach me, so am I them. Krishna, Shiva, Vishnu, Jesus, Buddha, Allah. The name doesn't matter. And in worldly activity, if you're a musician, do you want to be a celebrity or do you really want to be a musician? Do you love music? Now, the yakshas, celestial beings, rakshasas, demons. This is about getting what I want. Uh, these uh, yakshas oftentimes grant us boons, getting stuff we want. In the pantheon of demons, we tend to divide them into rakshasas and asuras. If you read the stories, the rakshasas are greedy, lustful. The asuras are angry. So here, the Rajasic people, they're about acquiring, achieving, getting their need. That's what their lives are about. Now, the Tamasic people, they're somewhat animalistic. What do animals do? They like to eat. They like to have sex. They like to sleep. Is that what your life is about? The other thing, we look at these as ancestors. This is about regret. I have a very dear friend. He was visiting his mother. They had a fight. She went off to her room. A few minutes later, David goes up to her bed and says, What are you doing? So she's in the fetal position, staring at the wall, and she says, I'm reviewing my misery. Is that what we do? One thing to be aware of trauma from the past, but it's another thing to live in the past, in regret, in self pity, in despondency. That's Tamas. Any thoughts on this? Going on, next verse. Do the next two are in verses together. Okay. Ashastra vihitam goram tapyante yeta pojanaha damba hankara samyukta namaraga balandita parshanta sharirastham. Yutagrama 
those men who practice terrible austerities, not enjoined by the scriptures, scriptures given to hypocrisy and egoism, impelled by the force of lust and attachment, senselessly torturing all the elements in the body, and me also who dwells within the body, you may know these to be of de demoniacal resolves. So here we have the demoniac. We went into this in depth into the last chapter. Let's parse what these kinds of thought structures and activities are. So what's the first one? Let's take a list. Those men who practice terrible austerities, not enjoined by the scriptures. So we have particular austerities, which are fruitful, beneficial for us. But there are certain austerities that we can do that are counterproductive. So for example, uh, who here's done the uh, meta meditation at the end of a Vipassana retreat? May all beings be peaceful, may all beings be happy, may all beings be liberated. Other, that's, a, that's a, an austerity, it's a practice. Other people may say, he was so mean to me when we broke up with him. I hope he breaks his legs. I hope his business fails. I hope he's <laughs> sick all the time. Some of us who have gone down those roads, we're sending out all this negative energy out of vengeance. And I want to hurt people who have hurt us. Stop that SOB and I want to wreck his life. These are austerities that are contrary to scripture. Any thoughts on that? Next idea. Not enjoined by the scripture. You got that. Given to hypocrisy and egoism. Yes. So, one of the most important qualities that we want to develop is satyam, truthfulness, straightforwardness. Some of us just lie. We do selfish, dishonest things and we lie about it. Or we don't really think our history is good enough, so we make up stories. And then the worst person to lie to, who do you think it is? Yourself. You got it. Some of us are in great denial. about what's really going on. So it's of great importance for us to be able to tell the truth, first of all, to ourselves. Tell the truth, be honest before God. Now, I'm going to give you all an important practice. Somebody in your life needs to know all your secrets. That doesn't mean there's one person who knows all of your secrets. We are as sick as our secrets. Oh, I could never tell anybody about But these become burdens and they get born a, a blown all out of proportion. Who here's had the exam and you've done something just so terrible and you find someone you trust and you say, I have to tell you, five years ago I did blah 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 and I feel so terrible. Oh my god. So I did that too. 
then all of a sudden you find you're not terminally lonely. Who's had an experience of that? This will be the value of a therapist. Christian tradition, way, way back when in, in Ireland, this was after the fall of the Roman Empire, before Europe was re-Christianized, early Middle Ages, early Dark Ages. The monastic tradition stayed alive in Ireland, of all places. They developed this thing called an amicus alma. Anybody here got any Latin? Friend of the soul. Hmm? Friend of the soul. Friend of the soul. Very important to be able to be truthful not only with yourself, but, but when you share it with another person. For many of us, this is the first real exercise in letting go of identity with ideas of self. Because if I'm afraid to tell somebody why, bad to them. Afraid I'll be hated or rejected or stuff like that. Now, I'm not saying compulsive disclosure all the time. Be prudent. But it's a value to not have to live with our secrets. So this is part of being free from hypocrisy. Be right sized. What's the second idea after hypocrisy? Egoism. Yeah. So, what do we mean by egoism? <laughs> when my attention, the focus of the mind, is on the small self. How am I doing? Am I okay? What do they think of me? Now, Thinking you're a piece of poop is not humility. That's another form of pride. It's another form of egoism. I like to define humility as not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's a big difference. So at the level of the personality, the yogi wants to be able to have a, um, an honest appraisal of their strengths and their weaknesses. Welcome to the human condition. We're free from having to protect and defend let everybody know how great we are. Or the opposite. I'm the worst person in the world and I need to tell you about it. That's another form of egoism. Next idea. Impelled by the force of lust and attachment. And I think he's used the word kama. Kamarat balan Yeah. So kama here, I would not translate it as lust. I would translate it as craving. Because lust, at least for us Americans, carries a predominantly sexual connotation. But here it means the desire to be gratified in all sorts of ways. You can lust for money, lust for approval, lust for attention. So uh, first one was common. What was the second one? Um, Ram. And in English, attachment. Yes. So being attached to things, this is mine, get away from it. And then the subtler forms of it, i.e. need to have it my way. We call this control issues today. All of this is part of what he calls 
the demon and the high priest. So did we get all the pieces of it? Of Shoka 5, there's six to go. We did two together. Oh, yeah. Next part. Senselessly torturing all the elements in the body. So these are people who bought cities and they do all sorts of strange practices to try to acquire power. Or, you know, what? what's, I can't remember who said it, you can never be too rich or too thin. There's some famous woman who said that. But many of us torture our body in so many ways. How much work are you going to get done on your face? I actually have a friend who got hooked on testosterone and all sorts of other pain drugs because as he got middle age, she wanted to still look good to get laid, he ended up totally ripping all the ligaments and tendons in his shoulder because he was so unaware of his body doing all this stuff. Next idea. And then something about and torturing me or... Yeah, and me also who dwells within the body. So you can't really hurt But we can superimpose on the pure self this jiva bhavana, this idea of self. We spend a whole lot of time in self pity, low self esteem. So many people are. Narcissistic personalities with low self-esteem, meaning I'm the piece of poop that the whole world revolves around. And we torture ourselves, we beat ourselves. If I've been doing this work 40 years plus, 47. In all those years, if I had ever seen anyone get value from beating themselves up, oh, I'm so terrible. Why did I do that? I just saw oh, that was so horrible. I, I recommend it as a practice. But in all those years, I have never seen anyone get value. Some of us think I won't improve if I don't beat myself up. We say things to ourselves in our own mind that we would be horrified if we saw some mother or father do to a child in the supermarket. This is my understanding of torturing the self. Is that the end of those two? You may know, do, no, you may know these to be of demoniacal results. Yeah, so this is the demoniacal results. Okay, next verse. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You spoke about like dying and anger and all sorts of negative. What about white lights? Like this, the kind of things you say so that you soften the blow for another person. But even though That's I struggle with those these bullshit. days. Bullshit. They yeah. are lies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's it's a justification and rationalization of your lack of integrity. Where do you draw the line? Everyone who lies feels justified. Now. Compulsive disclosure is not required. 
I had a friend who, who would be in line at the supermarket and he'd say to the woman in front of him, gee, you have a fat ass. <laughs> and then he wondered why he was punched and thrown out of markets and stuff like that. Well, I'm truthful. I don't lie. And I said, well, did you happen to notice whether or not she had a pretty colored scarf? Or maybe you liked the jewelry she was wearing? She might have had a pretty smile. You know, we, we rationalize, we justify. So uh, first of all, it, white lies will disempower your son called father. Because the, the unconscious has no sense of humor. It doesn't compromise. It takes whatever we want and puts it into action. So, so you can say things to people that are truthful without having to lie. So give me an example of a white lie. Let's see if we can find a way to be truthful. So yesterday, for example, two of my friends invited me out for dinner and I kind of wanted to go, but I ended up spending time at another friend's place who offered me soup and I wasn't hungry. So I said, oh, I'm a little tired. I'm not gonna make, make it for dinner today. Sorry. So, but that wasn't the full truth. But you could certainly say, I'm not gonna make it for dinner today. I'm sorry. Wasn't that the truth? Yeah. Frequently we think we have to justify Explain, and we don't. Yeah, it's usually the explanation we need to be. Yeah, most of the time we don't. Which you think we do. Can I find another example of that? So let me work with her oh, yeah. first. And I'll get to you. So there was a classic example. You could have said. I'm not going to make it to dinner tonight after all. Sorry. Instead of saying I was tired. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And what did you want to do? Go be with other friends? No, I was genuinely tired. So it That's wasn't. That's not a lie then. It's not, but it's, it's not the full truth. So I was struggling with the fact that I actually went to another friend's place. Very mellow, had soup with the husband, wife. And yeah. And if she says she's, you know, pushy, why not? You could say, I have plans with other friends. Mm. You know, there's a way to be truthful and still be kind. But my suggestion is don't lie. Any thoughts? I have another example, Jim. Go ahead. Let's say you have a relative. Let's say it's your grandmother who's very, very anxious, right? And so let's say she's in the hospital and the doctor tells the family that she doesn't have, that she, her, her condition is very severe. But you know, if you tell her, it's going to just make her more anxious and make the situation more severe. But if she asks the family later, you know, what did the doctor say? What do you say in a scenario like that? Well, most doctors will not tell the family things like she's going to be dead in two weeks, first of all. Now, I will say there's one time where I do think it's appropriate to lie. And that's when someone has dementia. Because sometimes the truth is an agitated man. So, for example, I have a friend whose mother's in memory care. And she says, oh, you haven't come to see me in months. He doesn't say, that's not true. I was here on Sunday. He says, well, I'm here now. 
That's for the sake of the other person. That's one of the few times, because because people with dementia can get very agitated in front of people that way. But what's the difference? Like, let's say Deepa's friend also gets really agitated when she doesn't see Deepa. Like, I still think 99.9% .9 of the time, tell the truth, go through life committed to a life of rigorous honesty. Because it's a slippery slope. It's a very slippery slope. Some of us lie a lot more than we're willing to admit. Satyam is one of the things we aspire to. If you are studying Raja Yoga, it's one of the yamas and niyamas. Satyam, truthfulness. We aspire to it. Doesn't mean we grasp, develop it, master it overnight but at least make it a target and work towards a life of rigorous ethics. Jim, may I add something? Please. Just uh, to what you said that 99.9% .9 of the times you can be truthful. So just in that context, uh, I wanted to uh, share that I was uh, reading also in the Mahabharata that, uh, you know, there are times when uh, apparently for the sake of a higher good, even Krishna is uh, sort of saying it is okay to lie. For instance, uh, during the Great War, Yudhishthira tells uh, Drona, the literal truth that Ashwatthama has died, but Ashwatthama in that situation was an elephant that he was referring to, but he wanted Drona to misunderstand Ashwatthama as Drona's son, because that grief then, uh, you know, disempowers him and they are able to kill him. So, uh, what I understood, what I understood from this was that, uh, you know, within the realm of uh, Maya or sort of relative truth, relative existence, having a hundred percent truth uh, principle cannot function. And there may be this point one percent uh, of times when, like you said, you know, during if someone has dementia or something like that. But as long as we're not, as long as the intention is completely pure and definitely, uh, you know, uh, for the greater good, in that case, even the Lord says that it is okay. That's fine. Also, if you're a soldier, you can lie to the enemy to defeat them. It happens all the time. Right. But those are rare Exceptional, the yeah, ones, right. The ones that are corrosive to our soul are the times we lie when what we really want to do is save face and protect our own. Life. Right, right, sure, yeah. So for example, you know, you, you have to figure this out. Did you want to continue to look good to your friend? Was it a self-protective thing? too much effort to explain why you never have to but see most of us don't understand please please let this in no is a complete sentence you can say what was that what did i give you as an alternative i'm not going to make it i'm not going to make it to the dinner after all yeah you, know, you don't need to justify. You don't need to explain. That's our issue. We do that. And it's a slippery slope. If I think that I have to be nice, you know, look good, come up with a reason. And then, first of all, what's going to happen if your friend talks to these other people? Is it going to happen?
she finds out that you went over there and tired my ass. <laughs> you see? No, one was a restaurant, one was a home. <laughs> there was no game face <laughs> required. No, no, no. My point being, yeah. what if she talks with those other people? She might get hurt. Of course. Yeah. That's the problem with, with, with fibs, with white lies, things like that. They, they, they're just a slippery slope. And, it, and it's contrary to the fundamental teaching. And, and many of us have issues about truth things. And I'm not saying cash register honestly. Most of us are fine with that. Yeah, I think that's why. So I live my life like an open book, so I don't, if you ask me anything about my life, I would tell you, honestly. But it's these little social situations where it's a lot of perception management, feeling management that I find myself even completely unconsciously resorting to it, which is why in, in reverse reflection. Why, why don't you just pray about it? I think, I think you will come up with your answer. I can only share with you for me. I aspire to a life of rigorous honesty. I don't even cheat on my taxes. <laughs> All right. Did we finish these two verses? Yeah. Next one. The food also, which is dear to each, is threefold, as also sacrifice, austerity, and alms giving. So here he's giving us dimensions of our life food, sacrifice, austerity and almsgiving, how to do it in a sattvic way, how to do it in a rajasic way, what is tamasa. So I think he starts off with food. So let's take a look at this. Now, let me give you a little side thing here. Our dear great Mahatma Ramana Maharshi once was asked by a disciple, how do I maintain a sattvic mind? And Bhagawan's answer was, eat sop with food. All sorts of reasons. Because the mind and the body are really just two parts of the same thing. And what we eat makes a difference. So let's see how he breaks this down. Should I go on to the next one? Yeah. Ayu Sattva Bala Rogya Sukapriti Vivardhana Rasya Snigdha Stira Hitya Ahara Sattvika Priya The foods which increase life, purity, strength, health, joy, and cheerfulness, including good appetite, which are savory and oleaginous, sub substantial and agreeable, are dear to the sattva. So here we have a generalized description of sattva food. By and large, the suggestion is that you eat vegetarian, that you eat fresh food. Now, they didn't have fresh frozen in those days. Fresh food. Pick fruit and vegetables to prepare. Balanced the grains in your legumes and things like that. In terms of meat eating, there are lots of good reasons to 
be vegetarian. Some of us find it really difficult. My suggestion is listen to your body. Body will tell you what foods it wants. You're eating meat now, no big deal. In time, you may find your diet light. And some of us may have things like digestive issues and stuff like that and are kind of impelled into more solid food. Any thoughts on this? So, you know, we're finding modern society today. I don't know anybody who opens up a can of beans anymore, green beans or peas. And, you know, things like if it stays in the refrigerator for two weeks, chances are your limb broccoli has lost all its nutrient value. Just being mindful of stuff like that. Next one. Sorry, can I ask one question? Um, sure. About eating meat and the principle of nonviolence, I, I am trying to eat less. I mostly eat fish. But I, I feel kind of bad about it. But I don't, but I feel like I also cannot function very well if I don't eat something that is animal based. Well, your body may need protein. Uh, there's a Sufi prayer, because the Sufis, you know, they're all from the Middle East and that part of the world where, you know, you can't grow at vegetables very easily in the sand. So there are prayers you can do to thank the animal for giving its body. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we need to know is that life feeds on life. So I guarantee you, you will eventually be food for worms. That's where mm -hmm. you're headed. So again, if you aspire to a vegetarian diet, um, if your body's craving like the fish, you know, uh, I'm not a dietitian, but basically if you're eating vegetarian, a lot of people are like junk food vegans. And that's a lousy way to eat because you're not getting enough protein. You're usually eating too carbs and a lot of sugar and stuff like that. That's not a healthy diet either. But uh, I grew up eating meat. I digest meat with no trouble. But I like to be, I call myself vegetarian niche. Mm -hmm. I'm 90 plus percent vegetarian. If I'm served meat, I'll eat it. Okay. Thank you. But again, the Dalai Lama eats meat. Oh, really? He does. Because in Tibet, you can't grow vegetables. That's the way he was raised. That's what his body is used to. But isn't he the first Dalai Lama to eat meat? All the prior Dalai Lama? I have Lama. no idea. He is. So he um, was the first one who started eating meat with all the prior Dalai Lamas. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I believe that because... Um, it's real hard to get vegetables into that. And if you're, what's the elevation of Lhasa? It's really high up. I just can't imagine that you'd have vegetables. Either that or they have pretty crappy diets. Yeah, I can check into it. But I guess I'm more overall struggling with this idea that just say a prayer for the animal and then it's fine to go ahead. I didn't ahead say and... that. I said that'll help you deal with your regret. But I'm not a dietitian. I'm only telling you what I do. I'm vegetarian ish. And the scripture suggests that we practice ahimsa. And most people, if they spend years in the spiritual life, move towards a vegetarian diet. But you don't want to beat yourself up if you're having a hard time doing it. I don't know, is that useful? 
Are you a vegetarian? I am, and I do grew up eating meat. Um, yeah, I can see that it is hard to for a lot of people to be vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, I just struggle with the whole like I've heard it a lot. Just say a prayer for the animal, and that's okay. And you know, it sure makes you feel better. Well, and that's and, where the issue yeah. is. That's where the issue is. The animal, that's another issue. That's the ethical reason not to eat meat. But if you're going to eat meat and you have regret, to thank the outcome. All the Native American cultures, they have hunting prayers, things like that. It's a big part of most indigenous cultures. It's, I don't want to get caught up in that because it's, it's a side element. So the idea here is if you want a sattvic mind, eat sattvic. All right, one more. Oh, it's too slow for us to get there. All right. Katva manalvana tyushna. Tikshna Ruksha Vidahinaha Ahara Raja Sasheshta Dukha Shoka Maya Prada Yata Yamam Gatarasam Duti Paryushitam Jayat Uchishtam Apichametham Ojanam Tama Sapriyam The foods that are bitter, sour, saline, excessively hot, pungent, dry and burning are light fat or rajas, rajasic and are productive of pain, grief, and dis disease. So spicy food, not sattvic. <laughs> Swamiji loved it. <laughs> you eat chilies, rajasic food. So Indian food, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah sorry. Most of the food you eat, rajas. <laughs> Um, and for example, if your caste is Shakya, you are enjoined to eat meat. You're supposed to. And you should live wire. Yeah, even I agree with this one. Should I read the second one? Yeah, go on. That which is stale, tasteless, putrid, and rotten, refuse and impure, and impure, is the food like is the food light rather than and I love a good green. <laughs> or blue cheese. Hmm? Blue cheese. Yeah. But here's what, one of the things that I find very interesting. We talked about this a bit before class started. The servant class in India, the Shudras, ended up eating leftovers. After you work for the Brahmins or the Kshatriyas, you're cleaning up, you got to, have, you know, take the leftovers home. So food that is stale, putrid, stuff like that, you got to go through it. And if something is spoiled, you throw that out and eat what's a little bit left, stuff like that. Or the miserably poor, You know, when you see homeless people going through trash cans, you see that. Do you think it's because they like to eat trash? Do you? So we have to be very careful that much of this judgment on what some people eat can be the result of their social, their caste, their economic situation. Not necessarily that they might just really like to eat sattvic food if they had the chance. But there are people you know, who eat and like really gross food. Live 
on McDonald's. <clears throat> so in our modern era, basically the overriding principle is this. Your food affects your body, your body affects your mind. If you want a peaceful mind, eat some food. If, on the other hand, you're eating a lot of heavy food and pizza every night and all this kind of stuff, full and lethargic and overeat, perhaps your mind state is being affected by the chew. And then the moral consideration, I think, is absolutely valid. We've come to see that uh, the agro-farm business pretty pretty horrific to the animals. So we absorb their But I never tell anybody you should do this, you should not do that. What I say is look to your ethics and listen to your body. Really pay attention to your body. You'll know where to go next. Any thoughts on this? Jim, what are some of what you say like the top suffering foods? Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. Like raw or in the cooked? They can as be well. cooked. But they say don't let them sit around for hours. So if you steam some broccoli and it sits in your refrigerator for four days, it's no longer software. What about things like coffee or tea or? They don't really talk about that. I don't know what Ayurveda says about coffee. It's generally not. It's, a, it's an intoxicant. Yeah. It's not generally considered food. It's administered in times of illness if you need to. So even alcohol is used as medicine if you need to. Alcohol would be highly toxic. But it's natural wise. No, it's toxic. Makes you go unconscious. It dulls you. Now, Swamiji, when you can fly across the Atlantic, you can fly first class, and you have a scotch wine. One. When he was flying across the Atlantic, he wasn't having a cocktail every night. Like this scotch. You know, we've come to see that uh, grains that aren't highly milled are better for us, whole grains rather than, you know, highly refined. It's a lot of information. Does that help? Yeah, I was just wondering if something specific was like very soft or anything. I'm I'm not an expert on that. I talked to Deepa. She's probably far more on it. My what I want to leave you with is your body has an innate intelligence. Listen to your body. Pay attention to how you feel when you eat something. Your body will let you know. Ask me if I'm willing to give up my Campanzola cheese. No. <laughs> all right. Oh, indeed. Is that all of it? Yeah. Oh, good, Namada, good, Namida. Purnat Purna Udachate Purnasya Purna Madaya Purna Meva Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Purna Maha Hari Om The other thing is we never want to beat somebody else up because they're not living to our ethical standards. 
that's pointless. You know the joke, you know how you could tell a vegan? They're funny, they'll tell me. <laughs> but the Master Jesus said, we are defiled not so much by what we put into our mouth, but by what comes out of it. So if you live a very pure life, and yet your speech is filled with hate and egoism and jealousy and vengeance. God's sake, clean up your mind and have a state. Let's get things in their right priority. I always find it very interesting people who are, oh, save the turkeys, save the turkeys. And then they're just filled with rage at people who don't agree with them. All right. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank Hello. you, Jim. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.